uh, we have a talk from Dennis Pearl from Penn State University. And he will be talking about interactivity takes interaction. Thanks, Raphael. Let me get my slides going here. I thought I was going to follow an edutainment break, but I guess we're. OK, so um, I'm Dennis Pearl from Penn State. Uh, and um, there's a, a two-year-old running around upstairs, my grandson, who may join me as a co-presenter. Uh, I think we've heard a lot. And I'm completely convinced that the use of music is really an engaging way to present STEM material and to build a welcoming class culture and consolidate memory and encourage deeper exploration of that material by students. But uh, unlike most people here, I have never, never ever uh, sung before a live audience, um, which basically means that I could sing for you, but if I did, I'd have to kill you. Most instructors, myself included, have really little music abilities, but yet the compelling evidence that it's a helpful way to present STEM material uh, speaks to, well, okay, that doesn't seem unusual to me because after all, I, I don't run a virology lab, but I, I use infectious disease uh, data as examples in my class. So how to best do I sort of help create song-based resources by, by contributing content? How best to present that to the class and integrate them with other resources to form lesson plans? So the big theme here is, is not only the creating the interactive material for the class through interaction with multidisciplinary collaborators, but also that I wanna point out that it shouldn't just end with the song, that, you, that the song is one part of a, of a more complete package for teaching specific learning objectives. So here I'm gonna present an example from statistics and teaching the normal approximation, which uh, arises out of the probability uh, uh, concept of the central limit theorem. So what do you start with? You always, in thinking about designing uh, a, a particular part of the curriculum, you have to start first with what are the specific learning objectives, the goals you have for the students to come away understanding. Here, uh, with the normal approximation, we're talking about the idea that all possible sample means that might arise from the process of taking a, a random sample will approximately follow this bell-shaped normal curve. Hi, sorry, Dennis, is, are, yes. you sharing, are you sharing slides? I am. Oh, okay, so we can see them, yet. Yeah. Oh, then I am failing to share screen. <laughs> ah, now starting to share. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So um, in presenting the learning objectives, so what I want to get across first off that the idea that that it's the process we're thinking about, the process of taking a random sample and then looking at the average of those and, and the idea that across all possible sample means that might arise from that process that that's the distribution that would follow the normal curve. And it's true for any population with a, a finite variance if the sample size is large enough, but uh, the approximation is obviously gonna work better if the sample size is larger or if the original population is itself close to the normal curve, for example, being symmetric. And I want students to be able to recognize the difference between the types of distributions that are floating around here. There's the original population distribution then there's the distribution of the individual values that show up in your, in your random sample, which are supposed to be representative of that population. And then finally, there's this idea, sort of a thought experiment about all the possible sample means that might arise from that process. That's the, the sampling distribution. So those are the three big learning objectives I wanna get across. And I wanna use a kind of a learning model here to uh, present all the contents in my courses. I, 
I like the uh, Savon and Middendorf's uh, EEGP model, which basically says you need to have four components to teaching for every learning objective you want to get across if you want to optimize retention um, and uh, conceptual learning of, of any learning objectives. First, the G part, that's sort of getting the general uh, principle across. The two E's means you want to give at least two different examples so that students see that the general principle you're, you're describing uh, can be applied in multiple contexts. And then the P is very important, of course, practice. Students need to have practice in applying those, those principles. And so I want to apply that across these three learning objectives in my example. And I want to try to do it in a very efficient way that hopefully doesn't use up a lot of, of time uh, in class. Okay, so here uh, in looking at the central limit theorem, uh, Greg Crowther, who we've met many times here from Everett Community College, wrote a nice uh, central limit theorem song as part of the artist collaborative that was associated with Project Smiles. And in Project Smiles, the idea was an interactive song where students would, would um, answer statistical content questions. And then based on their answers, those answers would be used in the song, either through a synthetic voice or, or through multiple recordings of the different uh, types of examples that they might've chosen from a drop-down menu. Uh, in this case, you can see in, in Greg's song, there's a example of the population of Chicago household income, something that would be very right skewed, but students in their, in their um, efforts uh, leading into the song might have chosen a different type of population from a drop-down menu. And so the song was able to incorporate different um, words in that uh, particular part of the lyric. So for those interactive components, I worked with uh, Larry Lesser and John Weber. Larry's at uh, UTEP, which is a, a majority Hispanic school. And John is at Georgia State University, which is a majority black uh, student population. I'm at Penn State, a large um, Midwestern uh, public university. And the programming for the interface here for the students to be work to work with was done by our, our resident uh, IT whiz, Bob Carey. Um, the audio recordings of that music, we got students involved in that. Uh, students from the commercial music program at UTEP, in particular, the students that worked on this song was uh, Joshua Lintz and Valerie Parada. And so I like the idea of involving students in the production here. These students in commercial music were able to you know, work with a live client, us, in, um, in their studies and it helped them in, in their careers as well. Uh, the video production that went along with this was a cartoon video that we wanted to integrate with the song. Uh, we had help there from British cartoonist John Landers, who does a terrific job of drawing cartoons about most anything, and editing to time with the music and to integrate with the learning objectives. In particular, think about that learning objective of displaying these three types of distributions, and we want to sort of show how they how they each arise in the in the sampling process. So uh, let me scoot out to uh, show you these uh, these efforts. So, oops, that's the. So here we have the interface students which we're seeing. Um, I went ahead and answered most all the questions that came up. The interface would you know, highlight green when you got something correct, red if you didn't and so forth, and give feedback if there was uh, a type of answer that we, we recognize. Here, this fourth question is asking for each description here, choose the corresponding shape of that population histogram. So we're working through these. If I go now to the one that I haven't filled out, scores on a driver's license test, you would expect most people to get 
relatively high scores on their driver's license test, and there only would be a few outliers that might uh, fail to pass the test. So that would be then a left skewed distribution. So yep, I got that one right. Uh, the weights of cartons of eggs would be something that you would expect to be relatively bell-shaped or normal looking because the weights of a carton of eggs is like the sum of the weights of the 12 eggs in size. So after students get all of these right, um, I now can move on to the next question. Select a variable that would look very different from the normal curve. So there are any of three of these answers here, either the Chicago household incomes example, uh, the heights of people at a parent-child uh, camp out, which would be a binodal modal distribution, or the driver's test scores would be correct answers to this. To this. If students uh, pick one of those, and then the song would then incorporate the one they choose. So let's have a look at the uh, songs here. So we now have three music recordings, one that would play if the household incomes variable was chosen, one if the driver's license test scores was chosen, and one if the uh, parent-child campout one was chosen. So let's go ahead and play the one that Greg originally wrote, which was the household incomes uh, population. The sample means have a normal distribution, even if the population does not. Their center is the center of the population. When this is true, you can sure do a lot. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Central limit theorem for populations with finite variance and means. If you know oh, oh, oh. the samples are independent and distributed identically, that's a step person's dream. The further that the population is from normal. The larger that your sample size must be. If your sample link, Chicago household income sample, lots of them to use the CLT. Whoa. So that's the completed song with the video. And, and you notice the important thing I'm pushing here is that uh, like Susie just mentioned how the song was that she, the work that she was doing was so well coordinated with the science. Here, the same kind of story, the video showing the three different types of distributions and how they're operate being, being well tied to the science that was related. So in, in Greg's song, so everything that students are seeing everything they're hearing, everything they're reading as they're reading the lyrics are all going together and forming that uh, kind of retention. But now we still haven't got that practice piece. So for the practice piece, uh, we developed a active learning web lab. And here again, I'm working with undergraduate students on, on this. Uh, during the summers, I supervise a research program for undergrads where the students prepare apps for teaching, they program apps for, for teaching, and then during the academic year, they're able to test those apps in live classes. So our central limit theorem app uh, was developed by students Chelsea Wong and Jiu Wu in uh, 2018, and then revised and updated by Leah Hunt in 2020. That, the program they're part of is called the Book of Apps for Statistics Teaching or the BOAST program because it gives students something to boast about in their, in their efforts. Uh, let me uh, uh, go back and show you a bit of, of that. Um, so, uh, what I want to, well, I won't have time for it. 
Um, so the app allows students, it's a shiny app if you know that, uh, that system, it allows students to manipulate sliders that guide, say, the degree of skewness in a right skewed distribution or in a left skewed distribution, the shape of a bimodal population. So they have complete control of the nature of the population, of the sample size, and of the, uh, and then able to see how the sampling distribution of the sample mean looks for different situations. And that's, um, uh, that allows them to connect back to the song because the displays in the app are exactly the same displays as we had in the song. The population distribution in the upper right, the sample uh, individual observations in a random sample in the lower left and the sampling distribution in the lower right, exactly ma matching the way, the way the music went. Now, along with that, and to make this sort of a complete thing, we developed sample, sample lesson plans, which uh, help an instructor guide their students both through the interactive components through the uh, sort of listen to the song and watch the video components and through the exploration in the, uh, in the app. And then we developed assessments that go along with that. So multiple choice items that can be used in exams or homeworks, which allows us if we want to compare situations with and without the music, with and without using the app and so forth. And then following along those lines, with the material that students are using online, we can do the web analytics. We maintain the log files from all the anonymous interactions with the software from around the world as they, as they occur. And so we're able to see, well, which parts of this are students having success with? Which parts are they needing more help? How can we add uh, new directions to the, to the um, uh, uh, different components here, or what kind of feedback might we build into the software and so forth. So watching those um, log files and can be an extremely valuable thing and can be the data sets produced can be used by researchers after the fact. It's all sort of anonymous data coming from whoever, which, and but without cookies here, we're, we're just seeing um, sort of what buttons were pushed and what, what answers were typed in. And that's extremely valuable information, even though it's, it's anonymous and we can't really do any uh, pre-post uh, different time points uh, research with that. So that's my presentation, a uh, paper on the SMILES project, the paper on the BOAST uh, uh, web app project, the websites are all here. And I, of course, I'm happy to answer questions as they arise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh... Any questions for Dennis? I don't, I don't see any questions in the chat. I see, one, uh, see a comment. The lesson plan guide is great for those who have never used songs to teach. It would give them a starting point. And... Yes. Um, uh, yeah, and that's the nice thing. As I say, I'm completely you know, uh, non-musically talented my, myself, but uh, directing students, for example, uh, as part of a homework assignment to listen to a song, read the lyrics, and uh, write reflections on how those lyrics relate to learning objectives. Those types of assignments for work well for some for songs. Uh, some songs, the the Smiles Project songs have their own built-in lesson plan, and uh, the lesson plans for the web apps are little uh, one-page lesson plans that uh, would be given to teachers that ask for them. And, and a quick question here, Dennis, would you have comparisons of educational effectiveness with and without the songs? Uh, yes, we did a little bit of work. This was sort of more immediate recall uh, where we had uh, the questions that were sort of built into smiles and then asked uh, in a different context, similar questions and see how much they improved after listening to the music over the next three days. So relatively, quick and, uh, situation. Uh, the other study involved later on um, for um, uh, with and without the apps and with and without music, where we're talking about uh, 
long time afterwards, say in midterms or finals. Now, of course, here we're talking about two minutes, to two to five minutes on the music playing and 15 minutes uh, maybe of the exploration with the app. So all combined as a package, uh, it's, it looks as a, as a good effective way to do things, but um, obviously asking for um, uh, large improvements three months later uh, is asking a little much, but, um, but we have shown uh, significant improvements. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. I think I have used your Central Limit Theorem Shiny app before. <laughs> <laughs>